On behalf of the directors of Clinic Health Group and executive of Clinic Health Group, I'd like to thank our nurses within the group for the outstanding work that they've done over the past year and a half and since the inception of, of clinics. In the past one and a half years, we have gone through a most painful period in our country where we lost some of our relatives, our family members from COVID. And our nurses have been there at the forefront to make sure that uh, the fatalities are minimized. The, our nurses have put in their lives in the forefront like soldiers in a war to make sure that uh, our fight against COVID is won. And I'd like to say thank you, thank you to our nurses. We have lost some of our colleagues during this period, but our nurses haven't stopped being there for our patients and our communities. I've been fortunate in the sense that my mother was a nurse and I know what it takes to be a nurse. Where you have to wake up early in the morning, come back late at night, having to sacrifice being with your kids during the day. So I know exactly what I'm talking about and I'd like to, to thank you most dearly for the outstanding work that you are doing. And I'm fairly sure that with the commitment of nurses, we will be able to fight this pandemic. And there is no healthcare delivery system that is going to work without the presence of nurses. And to the nurses within the clinics health group and to the nurses around South Africa and the world, I salute you. So about that, good evening colleagues. Uh, technology sometimes does give problems. And welcome once more to our weekly webinars here hosted by Phoenix Health Group as we uh, gather uh, every week to get uh, information about uh, presentations on healthcare uh, in our industry. And this day is a special day uh, because we are celebrating in International Nurses Day. And so we just want to welcome, welcome all of you and we trust that uh, you shall truly uh, enjoy yourselves as we uh, get presentations from uh, the two speakers that we, we've invited this evening. We're still waiting for uh, one or two uh, of our members who will be joining us to jo uh, from Clinics Health Group, but the speakers are here. Uh, just note that this, um, these webinars are as usual, uh, CPD accredited, and it was uh, surprising when you know, quite a, a good um, thing to know when I was speaking to some of the nurse colleagues, they uh, were telling me that actually they also do get CPD points when they register here because when we started, we only uploaded to summer and they, from nursing, we're getting uh, certificates of attendance, but I'm told that now you are able to, even from the nursing point of view, get CPD points when you submit them to the to the nursing council. So it is quite exciting to know that. So please do send us your, when you register, give us your full details. Uh, you also uh, give your full information about the registration, either you're with the nursing council, or with the pharmacy council, or the health professions council, so that we then submit your details uh, to the relevant parties, then you get your CPD points for attending uh, this webinar with these webinars. And also note that these uh, webinars are recorded live on YouTube so that at any time when you want to watch a uh, review the presentation, you can always go to, to YouTube and watch the, the presentations. And so these webinars for both speakers will be, the presentations 
or both speakers will be available on, on YouTube when you log into YouTube. Or always make sure that you like us on YouTube and you'll be able to get a reminder about the forthcoming presentations. So this evening, we're quite excited that we've got two speakers who are in the nursing fraternity, quite experienced uh, academics and researchers, clinicians in the nursing fields and the health sphere generally. And we're excited that they, 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 they accepted our invitation to celebrate Nurses Day with us uh, this evening. So we'll be having two presentations. What's going to happen is that we'll get the first speaker to do the presentation, which is about 20 minutes or so. And then later on, we get the second speaker who will do a presentation. In between, we will not be taking uh, questions, but maybe there's a point of clarification or two, we may do so. But just relax and enjoy the presentations. So this evening, we know that tomorrow is uh, the International Nurses Day, uh, but because our webinars take place on a Thursday, we thought that you could do this and have a precarious of the celebrations. And we wish all the nurses a, a, a wonderful time as they celebrate Nurses Day, as nurses are the key uh, pillars in our healthcare uh, delivery system and education. And so we, the theme they say is our nurses, our future. So the both speakers will be looking at that, but they'll have topics or presentations focused on how they want to then address us. So the first speaker that we'll be having this evening is Dr. Swosiso uh, Zuma, who is a doctor of literature and philosophy. Uh, and it's called Total Quality Management and is a Senior Lecturer at the School of Social Sciences at the UNISA, University of South Africa, Department of Health Studies. Uh, Dr. Zuma is an R425 registered nurse and an accroche. He love to explain what that is, Dr. Zuma. <laughs> an educator and administrator. He has experience in professional practice, education, research, regulation, administration, and nursing association arena. He is currently the vice chairperson of the 16th South African Nursing Council, serving in the preliminary investigations, laws, practice standards committee, and as chairperson of the NIC Technical Working Group for Nursing Practice and Standards de Development. So we're quite excited to have uh, Dr. Zuma joining us this evening to talk to us uh, as we celebrate uh, Nurses Day. Dr. Zuma, we're quite keen to hear you speak to us. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pila, uh, for the good uh, introduction. And I think when they call, we, we, there's this thing called midwife, but we were called aqua chairs yes. as men. <laughs> but um, in a long run, uh, when we're in practice, they say you remain a midwife because the, the word means to be with, with the woman. So it, it actually can be applied to both men and women. But um, in terms of registration, we are said to be aqua chairs. But thank you very much uh, for the introduction and also greetings to the colleagues uh, and the participants and also i thought i wanted to also register my appreciation to clinics but uh, especially to you uh, dr pila because i think i know last year we also had the same uh, 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 webinar and i think it's very nice to actually have these uh, celebrations or events being organized by our colleagues uh, from medicine so we appreciate really your your your, your patronage for for the nursing profession so thank you so i'm going to then present um i'm getting to the presentation and i think as it has been mentioned the presentation is titled um the the, the in terms of the theme which is our nest is our future uh, I don't know why it doesn't need one to show. Maybe I must, um, yeah. Come on. Come on. Hi, Doc. Yeah, I don't know. I'm trying to get there, ne? Uh, but now it's showing me um, something that I don't ah, okay. know. What is, your, is your presentation open? It's opened, yeah, and I've put it, oh, there we go. I think it wanted me to talk to you, uh, then it will actually come right. <laughs> okay, now <I> <laughs> that's great. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> yeah, you know. Uh, no, thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, greetings. Um, I think, uh, as it is said, that we are talking about the theme, which is our nurses, our future. 
and I think I've been introduced. I come from the University of South Africa, um, which uh, is celebrating 150 years this year. But uh, we are the Department of uh, Advanced Nursing Sciences in the past when it started in 1975. So we have got 48 years of nursing education uh, experience. Now, <clears throat> today, the International Nurses Day. Um, this day is celebrated under the International Council of Nurses Authority. And uh, there was a time when South Africa was um, bad from being member of the ICN because of the apartheid regime that was taking place. So around 1996, we were welcomed back to the World Nursing Agenda with the NOSA affiliation as a recognized national nurses asso nursing asso association. And I think over time, this day has been celebrated um, in a, a way that is seen as if it was a DINOSA day, but DINOSA affiliated for the country. Because when at ICN, when they say South Africa is a member, they actually mean it and then say that it's because DINOSA is affiliated on behalf of the nurses of South Africa. So this is the heritage that does not only belong to DINOSA as, it, as the affiliate, but it belongs to, the, to all the nurses of South Africa. So the theme, now that we are part of ICN, that is used worldwide, is determined every year by the ICN, taking into account the situation of nursing and nurses all over the world. So this time, it is said, our nurses, our future. Now, a lot of people will call this a celebration, Sometimes it becomes a celebration in the developed countries, but in the developing countries, it's an event that is seen as a catalyst for change in order to further improve the quality of nursing in, 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 in these particular countries. So I thought I would give you the South African context in that in South Africa, um, as in accordance with the SANC statistics, we had 271,000 and 46 nurses who were on the registers. And these nurses are the nurses that are currently based in South Africa. So this number excludes those that are actually practicing outside the country because when you want to practice abroad, they normally ask for uh, some uh, uh, documents that actually kind of assist the council to understand that this nurse is actually not practicing in South Africa. So this number, it includes the public private NGO academia as well as non-practicing nurses who continue to pay the fees but are not practicing. So this number is for a total population of about 58.8 million uh, when I look at the whole statistics uh, uh, um, that are available. So somebody will say, are we having a shortage of nurses? It is obvious that we are having a shortage of nurses because that number is quite uh, not sufficient for the population that we are having. And uh, this number comprises of the staff nurses, your uh, registered nurses, as well as the nursing auxiliary. As you can see, we've got 157,152 uh, professional nurses. We've got 52,000 plus um, enrolled nurses. Then we've got 61,560 uh, in terms of the subcategory. And as you can see that, as I said, that these nurses, it does not necessarily mean that they are all practicing, but these are the nurses that we have in South Africa. So there's been a, a matter that says there's an aging nursing population. Um, you can see that uh, us above 40 going down to 65, we kind of make the majority of the profession. And I think these are the nurses if we say our nurses, our future, we are looking at these numbers that we are, we are projecting there. Now, what does that mean? It actually means that there is a likelihood that majority of nursing care for our patient will be offered by semi-skilled workforce. And uh, if the care is offered by semi-skilled workforce, there's also an increased likelihood that you actually have um, some patient safety incidences. Because according to Linda Aiken, one of the nest leaders, she has done research to prove that the care outcomes are actually 
likely to be positive if the care that is offered is done actually by the professional nurses. So because of this, we also find that nurses are bent out and then we'll find that at times they are said to be shouting to patients, uh, having negative attitude because they are not coping with the demands of the system. And sometimes when they don't cope with the demand of the system, they then actually um, take their anger and frustration to the, to, the, to the users. We also will find that we've got what we'll have as um, internal and external migration, that the nurses will move from public to private and from private to public and uh, uh, pri private to NGOs, because now they are actually um, uh, uh, not coping on the ground. So what can we do to ensure that there is a better future for nursing? But I thought we can talk about the future if we are celebrating. But the most important thing to understand is that the world and the South African nursing future is politically and economically contested. So it's not a sterile uh, a future. It's a future that needs people to actually work hard towards making sure that it's a better future. So ICN tomorrow, they will be launching what is called a charter for change because there's a need for global action for change. One of the steps they are raising there, they say, if we are to have a, our nurses as being our future, we need to protect and invest in the nurses' development. And uh, we also need to respect their right. And then we also need to address the issue of workforce shortages. So it calls for all of us not to act as if there's no shortage in the country, but to work together, how do we actually uh, improve the system? Now, um, you cannot actually address workforce uh, shortages if you do not have finance. So um, it actually says that nursing uh, future is not a cheap commodity. It requires that there must be money invested in ensuring that there is a future for nursing. But it generally calls also that we must appoint nurses to the executive. So organizations must ensure that amongst their executive teams, there, there is a voice for nurses. So that is a very important point that if we are to actually ensure the future, that there must be leaders of nurses in our management team. It talks about high quality accredited education. There's a debate of increasing the number of nurses. And the, the regulator will say, what about quality? So we need to actually come up to a point where we then strike a balance between increasing numbers as well as ensuring that we are producing quality. But also nurses want to stay in a healthcare system and think that they're going to have a future if we introduce nurse-led models of care so that nurses can specialize and actually become um, experts in the field. But then it actually also encourages that we talk to the issue of engaging National Nursing Association. As I was saying, that is not a sterile process, but it actually involves politics as well as the economies, so that we are actually working. So these are the 10 points that at an, at an international level are suggested that we must do if we are to uh, uh, ensure if, uh, that nurses are our future. But what about our own local action? So my suggestion when we're talking about this um, uh, nurses becoming our future is that there must be a multi-stakeholder nursing future forum, which is facilitated by government so that we are able to transform uh, our nursing. So we actually uh, are finding that sometimes there is a lot of discussion, uh, discussion in private sector, discussion in, in regulation, discussion in academia, but for us to actually secure the future, we need to sit down together as nurses and actually determine the future that we want for our country. I've mentioned the issue of um, having a nurse in the executive management. It's an essential point because you cannot transform something from outside. You need to transform something that you have a, a, a person in your management. The biggest challenge is that it mustn't just be any nurse. It must be a nurse who have got management skills and who have got uh, qualifications, as well as who understand the social and political context of the country, who actually sits in that particular executive management. Because otherwise, if we've got sterile nurses in executive management, 
we are going to have people who will go out to the profession to oppress rather than actually becoming a voice as well as a coach for the for the majority of the nurses in the organization i think i've mentioned this uh, we need to increase the quality of nursing education um, when i talk about quality of nursing education is that we have that uh, there is application of offerings for people to be able to train nurses and i think it has gradually changed you will find in the past that a a non-nurse will apply to actually manage a nursing school and then we'll be taking exorbitant funds from our people and exploiting them by offering them what is called a pre-nursing or courses that actually are not um, accredited or if they offer those courses they will offer courses in an environment that does not produce a quality practitioner so there's a need then to balance numbers with accreditation as well as the speed at which we are processing the, the request for accreditation. Uh, I think there's other things you can read. Um, as I've mentioned, we need to have specialist nurse-led models of care. Uh, we need positive practice as well as education environment. So the expected results for me, if we are implementing this, we will also have a common understanding of the professional nursing cadre that the country needs. Uh, in South Africa, there is what is called South African Nursing Council. It actually uh, is a council for nurses and midwives. But South African model says uh, midwifery is part of the nursing. And then there's a debate that says there are people who want to um, develop as midwife right from the start. So I think the country needs to come to a point where it actually decides then what kind of cadre that we want for our country. And then to balance quality and quantity in nursing. But the biggest point I would like to raise is that fully funded quality nursing education uh, and training must also include accommodation. Because as you can see, other professions they study in universities, they actually get uh, training, but they also at times are, are funded for accommodation. But a lot of time, our nurses um, who study privately, they will have actually a bursary for the program for education, but they must see for themselves how do they get funding, uh, funding for accommodation. And a lot of us, we learned a lot of things because we were accommodated in the nurses' home, and then we're able to be in a place with our peers and learn and role model and develop into becoming fully fledged um, a, a, a nurses that we are today. And I do think that if we do all this, we will actually have a retained nesting workforce uh, in our system. So I think these are the things that I wanted to raise, but again, I'm actually open to engagement so that at least um, the, 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 the team can also share their own experiences and their views as to how to ensure that we actually have a nurses as being our future. So thank you very much, Program Director. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zuma, uh, for this presentation and just uh, laid down the foundation what the expected outcomes are for celebrating. As you say, you, you, we are not able to celebrate Nurses Day in South Africa because of the challenges that we are, we are facing. Um, maybe just an upshoot uh, from, from my side before we move on to the next speaker. Um, I, I, reflecting on the Presidential Health Summit that was held just mm -hmm. recently, when we're looking at the future of nursing in our country, mm -hmm. are you satisfied or confident that the needs of the profession in nursing were catered for in the Presidential Health Summit? I saw there were about seven pillars or so that were identified. I mean, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Doc. I, I think for me, um, one, uh, the presidential summit afforded the regulator, the nursing council was there. It afforded the unions to actually be part of the, of the summit. And in that, um, nursing has been provided an opportunity to make the statement as to what the future of nursing should be in the country. So I think it actually uh, it depends on how do these different entities 
uh, I think for me, even it would have been nicer if before we went to the presidential summit, we actually had established this nursing stakeholder forum so that when a nurse from a, a, a council or regulator side speaks, she then states what is the future of nursing we want. And then a nurse from a union, when they speak, they then speak so that we all communicate one a, a, a position to government. So I think the, for me, the presidential summit was a start. And I think it really requires that behind scenes, we work to ensure that the nursing future is actually uh, uh, um, secured. But I, I'm grateful for the fact that at least we were given an opportunity to actually be part mm -hmm. of the of the process. Yeah, thanks. The summit, yeah. Yes. Now, thank you for that. We'll, we'll engage further as we take the next speaker. And I'm going to take uh, this opportunity also to introduce the head of nursing uh, in Clinics Health Group. Uh, she was she has some difficulty in logging in uh, earlier on. Um, our head of nursing is uh, Matron Lydia Moremi, uh, who's got many years of experience. Uh, when you were showing us the categories of uh, the nurses, they say that the nursing profession is an aging profession. And I'm sure as you have seen that some of us are over 40 and I dare say myself, I'm higher than that, I mean, older than that. Yeah, that between 40 and 60, that's the, the bulk of the nursing profession, I think the medical profession in general. So Metron Lydia Murim, I'm going to ask you to just unmute yourself and switch on your video and um, introduce the next speaker. If, you, if you're still with us. Okay. Can you see me? Uh, yes, Metro. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Bella. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. So, thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to introduce Professor Lizzie Marie Hugo van Dijk, who is a senior lecturer of our of the health science <clears throat> in the University of Free State. Prof is also involved in several national and international research projects and has supervised numerous masters and PhD, PhD students. She, is, she also serves at the, at the South African Association of Health Educationalist Central Committee as the, secret, the secretariat. She is also passionate about the professional development and education of health professional educate, educators. Prof, I couldn't say more about you. There are a lot of things that I've said. I've just picked some some most important information about you. Uh, over to you, Prof. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate it being here. I'm quickly just uh, want to share my screen. Um, can we just give me access to share my presentation, please? I see that I'm disabled to share the screen. Please try it again, Doc. Okay, brilliant, there we go. Okay, I would like to do this. And then to do this. Right, okay. I think we can start. So welcome everyone. Um, my name is Lisa Yuga van Dijk and I'm a senior lecturer at the University of the Free State and I just want to say welcome from a very cold Free State province but I hear that it's all over a bit cold. So I'm here to present to you. The we, we don't see your presentation as yet. Oh really? Sorry. Yeah, this, yeah, I don't know if we yeah, there's coming. Here we are. Really? Yeah, sure. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, everyone's set. Good. Okay. So um, I'm presenting to you today the futuristic healing nurses leading the way with technology. So when I was tasked to do this presentation, I turned towards the International Council for Nurses, ICN, 
and then the South African Nursing Council. And the ICN said that um, our nurses, our future is the theme for International Nurses Day. And Sank also elaborated on that, stating that the future of our nursing as their theme. So it was quite clear from these themes that the future of nursing is a focal point. So what does the future of nursing look like? Well, as you have heard now, I'm, a, I'm the PGDIP Nursing Education Coordinator, and my students are actually with me this week. And while we were talking during one of the contact sessions, I asked them, what is the first word that comes to mind when I say the future of nursing? And to my surprise, more than a third of the closet technology. And that made me think, how does a digital future in nursing look like? So uh, there is a growing consensus in the global health community that the strategic and innovative use of digital and communication technologies are essential. We see that digital health technologies provide, number one, opportunities to strengthen the healthcare system. It transformed the way the healthcare services are provided and the way in which people engage in those services. And this is already demonstrated in the, in the following examples. And I'm only going to mention a few because we don't have a lot of time. So I'm going to start off with telehealth. So there has been a lot of strides made in telehealth. We see that these face-to-face -face examinations where clinicians actually engage with the patients on a virtual platform. We also see pharmacists that provide telehealth to provide medicine management to their patients. And uh, this is specifically with patients with uh, chronic diseases. And then nurses-led telehealth is also starting um, to be more into um, the spotlight where nurses actually consult with patients then also on this virtual platform. And then another innovation that is worth mentioning is the drone system. So this is where medical supplies and medicine are actually being delivered to the patient. We also see in disaster areas where food and supplies are also being distributed to that areas. And then recently in South Africa, there's a lot of talk around delivering, for instance, blood products between healthcare institutions, which is life-saving. And then I think some of you may really be, um, have already worked with this. So this is the electronic health records. And this is implemented in many, many of our um, healthcare institutions in South Africa. And this system allows for patient information such as the vital signs, demographics, progress notes, laboratory data, radiology the reports, just to mention a few to be captured and kept. And this actually um, uh, take that thing of where an uh, institution needs to um, you know, destroy the records after a certain amount of time and to to keep that that records, it cuts uh, it cuts that cost away. So it can be um, cost saving in the end. Then another one, and I think most of us is um, knows about this one, that is the mobile health. And we saw specifically with COVID that with the contact tracing apps that, that was implemented, that it's actually beneficial for delaying the progress of COVID. And in South Africa, M Health or also Mobile Health, we see in community-based interventions. And one of the examples here is MomConnect, which you may have also all, all, also heard about. Now, 
I entered this slide because um, this was quite interesting when I went a bit further in my research. So this is an intelligent physical robot. And it's based on artificial intelligence or AI, as we know it. And it is nowadays being employed in hospitals, nursing homes, uh, mental health care centers, laboratories, and even patients' homes. And the first thing when I read about physical robots, I thought to myself, well, okay, I don't think they will be able to support compassionate side that we have as nurses or healthcare providers. But boy, was I wrong when I learned about Sophia. So Sophia is an example of a social robot. And I want to say she, if I can put it like that, or they are conceived as companions for older adults and are programmed to give emotional responses. So this actually made me think about with this rapid advancements in healthcare technology and the evolving disease profiles, I think that a, a patient-centric digital first strategy is no longer just a nice to have or a pie in the sky, but actually a necessity. So with digital healthcare, there is numerous advantages that has been described by literature, but there's also disadvantages. And with the telehealth, we see that there's benefits for both patients and um, practitioners. We see that there's a reduction in waiting times. We see that there's travel burden that's decreased. There's cost saving. Um, and there's also improved access to specialized care. And with this, I was actually thinking because primary, I'm a primary health care specialist, that's my clinical speciality. And I was thinking about the long queues and that we have in the primary health care facilities and then also the long waiting times. And I know that there was a lot of interventions already done to try to um, reduce that. But I thought, what, how would South Africa look in a few years if we can have nurses led telehealth, for instance, for, for certain patients um, in providing care. I think that will be marvelous just thinking about it. But I mean, obviously, we have to go through all the ropes. So maybe that could be a suggestion. So with digital healthcare, it enables us to, to exchange and store data. It enables remote and data, data capturing. So uh, for instance, I don't, the um, x-ray department can send the, the x-rays and the report already to me and I don't have to go now and wait for it or go and fetch it. So, and that enables actually that sharing of relevant information across the health ecosystem to create that continuum of care for our patients. It also reduces the chance of human error, and then it enhances health outcomes. And this has been um, stated by a lot of authors and literature done, or research done. Now, on the other hand, there are several disadvantages or concerns with the regard to technology and AI. And one of the biggest thing, and that's probably uh, another 45 webinar on its own, is the protection of human health information. And the conversation is about the ethics around, you know, giving patient information to who do you give it, what is in, um, what, like for instance, firewalls is in place to protect this patient data so it can't be hacked. So there's a whole conversation around that. The other thing is with the doctor patient or clinician patient interaction, we see that there's also a report of a lack of empathy because of that virtual platform. And then actually I loved when I entered this one. So the third disadvantage that we see or that I can mention is revolving around the, the frustration um, around poor technology implementation. And I could definitely agree with that. 
And um, in a study that I've read, they said that 80% of Americans encounter at least one frustrating experience with poor tech implementation every day. So I think a lot of us can actually agree with that frustration sometimes. So now that we've looked at the um, we, we stand with digital health, what is out there? We looked at the advantages and disadvantages. I want to focus to what does technology mean for the nursing profession and mid um, profession? And with the utilization of technology, of artificial intelligence in a healthcare um, system, the nurse's role is changing. And there is challenges, it actually challenges the nursing profession. And we know, like Dr. Zuma also alluded to, is that nurses and midwives represent more than 50% of the current work health work shortage. And then through AI and technolo technological advances, they say that that shortage can actually be alleviated. But now I also want to put another thing on the table. So as robots now learn to perform nursing functions, such, such as ambulation support, vital sign measurements, medication administration, the role of nurses in healthcare delivery is changing. And then one example that I could get is the one for, it's an AI system, it's called Trina. And it was tested in a nursing simulation lab. And this system is currently performing about 60% of predefined nursing tasks. So imagine be working a 7 7 and then having 60% of your work done by an AI system. Now, there's the other side to the coin, however. Trina is 20 times slower than a nurse, but this is still early days and there is still time for advancements. So we will see what um, they say in, in a year or two about Trina. So now that we looked at what it will be or what is the influences on, or, and it was just broad strokes of what's the influences on um, nursing, I want to focus to our, us in South Africa. So the WHO has a global strategy on digital health and they elaborate that the digital health should be an integral part of health priorities. The South African Nursing Department of Health embraces technology in their guidelines titled National Digital Health Strategies for South Africa, and it's a 2019 to 2024 guideline. And their mission is to establish an integrated digital health ecosystem of people, processes, and technology that supports health systems strengthening, health service delivery, effective patient care, and person empowerment. So this made me think when I read through the policy and then we're also with the WHO's policy. And I thought to myself, with to be successful in implementing what is um, laid on the table, we as nurses will need to be tech savvy or become tech savvy and will be should be able to lead the development of new models of digital technologies of patient care. So looking now at the global and the national agenda of digital health care, how does nursing in South Africa stay relevant in a digital era? And now this is playing into my um, corner, if I can put it like that, um, with regard to the reform of nursing education. 
And um, the strategies that I'm proposing, it's only three. It's the, it's the nursing education, it's leadership, and it's research. And I found an article from Broom and colleagues, or Booth and colleagues, and I, I think they they really hit the, the nail on the head with their recommendations. And what I'm going to say forms part of that. So if I should ask you how many of you were trained on informatics or digital health in your undergraduate postgraduate studies, I'm sure there will only be a few, if any. And I'm quite concerned as a nurse educationalist that we are, as educators are dropping the ball on issues of preparing our students for a digitalized healthcare system. I was actually, today I was involved in a study and um, with a protocol that we're writing and um, it said that the attrition of nurses was one of the reasons is um, the fact that they feel incompetent. So after reading that, then I thought to myself, are we contributing to that incompetent feeling because we do not train them to what they will be facing when they're in clinical practice? So that is some food for thought. I think that we should urgently, and this is also said by Booth and, and, and his colleagues that they should that we should create educational opportunities incorporating digital technologies at all graduate levels. Curriculum should be adapted for the growing use of digital technologies and um, especially with the aspects with regard to nursing practice. And we as nurse educators should be clinically relevant in our specialization so that we know if there is new technology that we can incorporate in our teaching and our modules in our curriculums. The other thing that I can propose is that we should be more innovative in our teaching strategies. And this comes with um, immersive technology such as virtual or augmented realities. And I am part of a team that actually is looking at how do we make virtual reality more accessible for South Africa and a larger context to Africa. And I know that people will say that it's so expensive, but I also discovered that there's quite a few um, platforms that is free online that can be used to enhance virtual reality. So the third, oh, sorry, the, the second thing that I would like to raise is the leadership in digital health. So I believe that the implementation of technology starts with oneself. And we as nurses should embrace digital technology. And with this, it should be, we should actually, actually actively promote and assist colleagues in gaining the expertise in areas of data analytics and virtual key models. So nurses from various specialities should be allowed to contribute to the creation and the adoption of digital health policies, both on national and local levels. So I think what I'm basically trying to say here with a building of leadership in digital health is if you don't have a seat at the digitalization table, bring your own chair. Otherwise, we risk being excluded from important decisions that, that's affecting our functionality as nurses and our relevance. The last one that I recommendation that I would like to make is the research on AI in nursing practice. So often when we talk about research practice, we think it's reserved for someone in academia at the university. But I, in my opinion, it's not true. All of us have the responsibility towards um, towards research and to see what is the best practices. So. 
Um, although there are many, many benefits with regard to AI, like we said now, there is improved patient outcomes. We can actually um, streamline workflow and then it also improves, improves um, efficiency. It must be shown in this nursing research. So we should investigate what technology works for us as nurses in a South African healthcare system. So in conclusion, I think I just scratched the surface today. There's so much more to say on this topic. But in conclusion, I believe that it is time, uh, the time has come for us as nurses to accelerate into a transformation to a digitally enabled profession to be upskilled in data science and other digital health topics to invest in and lead digital health developments and collaborate, and then also to be champions um, in informatics across all health or sorry, professional practices and to create leadership positions in digital health. So it is a brave new world out there. So let's embrace this digital era. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Les. Indeed, as you say, it's a brave new world out there and we need to embrace this uh, digital health technology. And uh, maybe for, uh, for, uh, as we wait for other colleagues to uh, jot down their questions, uh, colleagues, you are free to uh, ask questions and just write on your on the chat group your, your questions or just uh, raise your hand and unmute yourself and we'll be able to uh, to ask you to to raise your to ask your question. I see Siabonga Butelez has got a hand up, but before Siabonga, we ask you to to ask a question. I just want for you, Dr. Lisa, Dr. Zuma. Uh, just I mean, Dr. Zuma says that the I, mean, I, I alluded to this at, earlier on that the workforce it's uh, it's a middle aged workforce nursing force that we have, you know, forty to sixty years old, the majority, and you say that we must embrace digital health. We this 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 age group is it ready to embrace uh, digital health? Um, and wh what can we do to to fast track uh, this age group? I mean, I think both you and Dr. Zuma can respond to this question. Well, I think um, we we have will have to look. We're not going to run away from this. This is happening. If we want to know it or not, this this is coming. So the best we can do is start to prepare ourselves. And I think it also alluded in the in the PowerPoint that we should you know assist one another to become skilled. And um, I think it's definitely doable. It doesn't matter how old you are. And if you were born before computers, that most people say, I was actually, um, I have an online program for preceptors. So it's 100% online. And I had the First State School of Nursing actually participating in the course. And some of them said that they were, they struggled in the beginning, but then they were just, they were mastering it. And they were, I was really impressed. So I think it comes down to attitude. If you want to do it, then you will do it. And I think also to answer your question is that we will have to look at, to capacitate uh, capacitate people, we will have to look at um, in-service training and professional development with regard to new technology and to introduce people. So that is from just something from my side. No, thanks very much, uh, Dr. Liz, for the presentation. And I think um, the question for me, um, I want to say that they are getting there, uh, these uh, the 40 plus uh, into yes. getting into technology. Because I think from our side, like especially at UNISA, we no longer take um, untyped assignments or we are doing mm -hmm. online classes. We do, so in a way, trying to uh, encourage the student to actually become technology confident. 
But I think the biggest thing is that we must invest in nursing education in that colleges and um, private nays mustn't just be equipped in terms of the, uh, uh, what you call it, the demonstration rooms and all, but we must ensure that the areas in which nurses are being developed, especially for basic and post-basic um, education, is actually mm -hmm. well resourced in terms of uh, ICT resources. So that when they leave um, back to practice, they actually are then able to handle the, the ICT. Another thing is that I realize uh, in my uh, uh, moving around, you find that you go to a meeting of nurses. And then when you go to a meeting of nurses, there is a PA. And then when the leader is supposed to present, John, next slide, John, next slide. We must encourage our nurses to be to actually operate the computers so that they are able then to actually have I think what, from a computer to a digital tool operation we are actually becoming technologically um, a service. So I think those are the things for me that I think. But I think they are getting there, and we, we don't have a choice. We've got to. Thank you very much. Yeah, the world is moving fast. you can unmute yourself. Can we? I allow him to mute himself and ask you um, a question. Uh, good evening. Um, thank you so much uh, to Dr. Zuma and Dr. Liz Maria Hufandek for the enlightening presentation that you just gave us now. Really, as nurses, we feel empowered. I'm one of the unit managers in an ICU mm -hmm. setting. Uh, Dr. Zuma, the question that I'm actually having, it, it was very nice looking at the age that you actually presented on your slide. Now it actually raised the concern on my slide for the next coming five years. I'm worried that we are not going to have enough uh, staff on the floor and we are going to experience an increasing demand of nurses. But now I'm looking at uh, South African Nursing Council, the higher education institutions that are training in our nurses. They are given certain restrictions like numbers, how many nurses they can take. Do you think maybe we, sh we need to reconcile in time before we experience this shortage that's going to be severe with South African Nursing Council to actually increase the numbers to train our nurses? And then the, when I go, I um, think I must just also so throw the question again to Dr. Liz Marie Yehu, so that they can be answered uh, in once. Dr. Yehu, I like the, the technology that we are actually moving to, and uh, I'm impressed, especially in the ICU setting we saw during COVID-19. Some hospitals already started to implement it, uh, like doing the consultations and prescriptions that they were done uh, digital. But now, I understand that as lead, leaders and managers on the floors in a hospital, we have to embrace the, ICE, the information communication technology that is coming and the digital nursing platform that we are moving to. Do you think that as, as much as the hospitals are more than willing to support it, do you think maybe we need also to have some short learning programs in higher education institution to enhance this process? Thank you. Thanks, Siabonga. Dr. Zuma? All right. Uh, Th uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Siabonga, for the question. <laughs> I, I think the, the issue um, is that for me, I think one of my slides, I raised the issue of um, what is perceived to be um, we, are, we, we need uh, like to increase. And then there's this thing called quantity versus quality, right? So I think that's why I'm saying there must be this multi stakeholder nursing future group, which is going to sit down and look, because what is happening, there is a view that um, certain norms must be adhered to if you want to produce a quality health professional. So, but there's also the view that um, hey, we are facing a shortage. Let us train as much nurses as we, as we have to train. So there's a need of that balance, because I know of areas where um, increasing numbers in the previous order they were given. 
but you find that those nurses were not getting the individual mentorship and support to actually become um, a product practitioner. So we can do the increasing numbers, but three years down the line, when these products are ready to go to practice, then we say these professionals are, are, are not quite, but I agree to say, so I'm saying this might take, take um, a, a forum. We must try and find a balance between quantity and quality so that you actually are able then to, to mitigate the, 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 the shortage that is actually a scene as we are moving forward. So um, I hope I'm giving you the answer, but I'm not giving you a direct one, but as I'm saying that we, we, we can't, we see the shortage, but we're saying the shortage uh, dealing mechanism must strike a balance between the quantities as well as the quality of the, um, of the practitioners that, um, that are there. So I don't know if there's any engagement, but we can still take it, but that's where we are. Thank you. Yeah, that's very that's quick. Yeah, thank, thanks Dr. Zuma. Dr. Liz, Nick. So, Sia, um, with regard to your question, I think specifically with training, because, I mean, you're already in the setting and, and um, I mean, the technology is, is really starting to advance at, a, I want to say, almost an alarming rate. So we will have to sit and think strategically on how we're going to support our um, nurses. So we will have to think... Um, I was thinking now, we, I mean, in-service training, continuous professional development, which is the, the SLP that you would talk, well, no, your, the SLP was also one, continuous professional development, and we can link it to CPDs, and then also in our professional programs, and maybe with, um, with, with incorporating that in our curriculums. So I think that um, we will have to start thinking more strategically on how we implement or prepare our students and already qualified staff to be um, more comfortable and to be trained in the use of technologies. And actually, they say, um, I've read that they said that if you are trained or if you are introduced to technologies, you're more prone to use it and to accept it. So I think we have to start somewhere and i think training is definitely the way to go in in my opinion with regard to this so yes an slp will be brilliant um in service training the cpds um seeing that tank is also now moving into cpds so that can only enhance people's acceptability into um the use of technology. And I think that then alludes back to the previous statement that was made. So that's from my side. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Fande. There was a question that has, seems to have disappeared. I don't know if you saw that question. Uh, somebody had posted a question I can't call, but I think it was more about private practice and what was your view about uh, this training. Um, yeah, I don't know if the person there who who's, you saw that, Doctor Zuma. Yes, there's a I don't question. See that question from, anymore. Yes, there's a question from Andy Mukari. She is asking our opinion on pri on private primary yeah. cases operating without doctor's presence. Uh, E.g. Unja. Okay, Yes, yeah. I think I can take it. Um, yes, in that, I think one of the the, the international um, movement, as we said. There, there is a move for what is called specialist nurses um, a, a, a models of care. So I think these um, growing uh, private, and I think this is very nice because it says private primary health care service. In actual fact, the, the, yeah. the PHC, uh, in my view, um, is the platform where nurses are supposed actually to be working uh, quite um, uh, massively. The important thing is that we need to actually ensure that those nurses, they don't then attempt to become a, a, a mini doctors or mini surgeons in that what they do in those particular areas should be what is an allowed scope for them to be able to practice. Because I think mm -hmm. there's sometimes a tendency that you find that uh, in those particular clinics, then a person tends to go beyond what they are supposed to do and then risk occurs. But the important thing 
I think in South Africa, we are finding a lot of these emerging areas that nursing, nurses um, are, are exploring. It will be very important then that the, the regulatory bodies do not necessarily over-regulate, but they have to have a role in, in, in ensuring the safety of the patient. So I think in summary for me, we should appreciate when nurses uh, grow into their entrepreneurship, but we must strike a balance again between um, money making versus also the issue of patient safety in those particular um, services. Uh, thanks, Jack. Thanks, thanks a lot, Dr. Zuma. That question had just appeared on my screen. I don't know why. <laughs> um, there's a, yeah, thanks. You did, both of you didn't touch on this one, but I, I, I will ask, I will ask about that. You spoke, you and Dr. Zuma spoke about the specialized nursing care that you may be having a, a less skilled nurses going to in, in the future. But currently there's a shortage of ICU trained nurses in our country. And in, in the private sector, they are, there's, there's a move towards recruiting nurses from India. I don't know if I'm putting you on the spot now wearing your head as a member of the nursing council to say, well, what is the view of the nursing council of South Africa in terms of uh, encouraging the private health groups uh, to recruit in nurses from India. What I hear is that they may not necessarily be uh, trained nurses, but they are experienced uh, nurse practitioners in ICU settings. What's 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 council's view, or what's your view? If you may ask, if you if you want to venture into that about helping the crisis that you're facing in terms of yeah. uh, less specialized nurses yeah. in South Africa. Yeah, no, thanks very much. I think um, I, 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 I will have difficulty in wearing my country cap because they did not send me um, to the meeting. But uh, the, information that is, yeah, the information that is in the public domain is that, uh, in my view, Council did recognize that there is a shortage of the um, 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 specialized nurses, in particular um, the ICUs as well. To a point, yeah that there is a, a circulating document which is actually talking to um, nursing in terms of the um, uh, specialized areas where the ideal is that in a specialized unit all nurses must be specialized but can, the council has taken a concession to say that at least in a shift there actually should be nurses professional nurses but whoever supervises as a start actually, or as a way of um, 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 protecting the public, um, should be a specialist nurse. And I actually have heard nurses complaining that, no, 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 we cannot afford okay. it because um, uh, we don't even have. But the truth of the matter in practice is that on Friday, a, 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 an ICU supervisor or manager will turn her back from the unit and go home leaving general nurses uh, as, 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 as being the available resource to look after our patients. And I think in my view, that is not correct. Uh, in that if we are actually working, because I think what you've seen, I've seen when I review certain uh, clinical rosters, you will find that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, mm -hmm. there is a number that is allocated. But then on weekend, it seems acceptable that there will be no one. But, and I think for me, we can take it as a debate, but I really feel that if there is an attempt to secure agency nurses and, 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 but there's no chance, those that are in charge of those units should strive to ensure that they actually um, a, 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 at least cover the, the unit. Because when, when we, and I always say, when I ask them, is to say, if it was you lying in that ICU, would you be happy that we actually turned back our, our backs and left you in the hands of people? That, so I think that's one point. But um, what I know also, there's currently, um, if the people want to bring nurses from India, it's actually going to be a, a, a formal application process that mm -hmm. we'll have to be engaged on. And I, I do believe that um, whilst it, this is being, had, uh, being discussed uh, in the other conferences, I think it's high time that we who are in regulation, government and practice as nurse leaders 
sit down together and chart a way forward in terms of dealing with this particular um, 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 crisis. So I think I, I may not answer you directly, but I'm saying that in actual fact, before we consider bringing the nurses from other countries, we actually have got to ensure that we have kind of um, a, a looked at what other solutions can we have as, as, as the country. I don't know if uh, I answered you, uh, Doc, or... Yeah, no, no, mm. no, no that, that's adequate. I think it is a, it's a, it's a general response yeah. which has, yeah. does uh, lead to some direction in terms of yeah. how to deal with it. It mm. is appreciated. And Dr. Lin van Dijk, uh, um, robotic surgery, you know, there's this advance that is coming through in our various settings. I know, I know that in the pharmacies, there's some robotic uh, robots that have been used to dispense and that also now orthopedic surgeons and urologists are using ro robots now to, to do surgery. And you, you said you, you, you also want to encourage the nursing profession to in, in incorporate this in, the, in their setting. Uh, but currently, uh, when you look at it, our nurses, are they, I mean, how would you go about making sure that in our nursing academies or nursing colleges, this is incorporated and uh, looking at the cost of uh, robotic surgery? Dr. Van Dijk, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm here. I'm thinking quickly. Um, so, I mean, if we look at nursing, well, definitely, I mean, if they start doing um, the PG dip, for instance, in um, operational, is it op uh, um, theater te technique, then um, that should definitely be yeah. part of the curriculum. I mean, you need specialized um people that's that's doing that and i mean it takes training so that we should really look at um how we curriculize that part because that will definitely be a need um i think for them and also with undergraduate because i mean we do place our students for um in theater as well so one can also think about incorporating that as well, but definitely with regard to to um, theatre technique, they should definitely that should be part of the curriculum. There's no doubt to that. So that is why I said that when we are specialists and we present something, we should be on top of what is the newest technology that we can incorporate in that curriculum. And I think you know, I, I don't know if I answered your question, but that should definitely be, uh, there's no way that it can't be um, not part of the curriculum. Okay. Yeah, definitely it should be. Yeah, no, that's, that's great, yeah. And um, you, you, Dr. Zuma, mentioned that you know, what I loved about uh, you speaking that in, in, in nest leadership and that the, the nest leader must be part of the executive. And I think you mentioned that it must not just be anybody who will be there, but not speaking on behalf of nurses and making changes. And I'm sure Matron Lydia from Phoenix Health Group, who's part of us, would, would be happy to hear that. I know that she's part of the team that we begin together in executive. Um, but I think that is quite something that is, we're looking forward to that should be able to uh, have an impact in the, in the influence and the importance of this leadership in any clinical setting or in our executive leadership, whether in the public or the private sector. Uh, yeah, that's I think that's something that we we yeah. uh, I picked up from what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. No, I think that's very important, Doc. I think that, that's why we say that I think the future, the, uh, the, especially for me, those of us who are nurses who are here, um, is that we should look at our own niche and actually develop that niche so that um, we then become effective managers. And I think, I don't know, Mina, my own experience, which I think I've learned, was that when I was still in the operation, I did not become a sterile nurse that comes at 7 o'clock and goes off at 4 o'clock. I actually became active in the unions. And I think for me, biggest learning for my management expertise, I also got it there because I had theory, but I also learned strategies and tactics such that when a union comes into a, a management space, 
there's a lot of time where managers are shocked. But if you are a balanced uh, a nurse manager, you can actually deal with the labor movement to a way that it will support your, your own objectives. So I think um, yeah. my, my suggestion really for, for, for our nurses is that we mustn't think that learning is sterile. Getting a PhD is nice, but we must become what is called organic intellectuals. Mm. People who actually understand theory, but also appreciate the environment under which we apply mm. the, the, the theory. So I think yeah, that's one of the, the, the suggestions that I can have to our colleagues as we plan for the future. Thanks. No, thank you very much. Yeah, that, that's the term I for. I wanted to use that for cotton sterile nurses or sterile managers. So I think I already remember that we must become organic people and we are quite active and proactive in, in terms of our engagement with the various stakeholders that we encounter. I don't see any more questions or with the hand that has been raised. And I think we've covered quite a lot in the space of time that we had. And I'm going to then ask uh, Metro Lydia, uh, who's the head of nursing. Uh, to do the vote of things. I just want to appreciate both of you, uh, Dr. Suzu Zuma and Dr. Ismail Fandek, your Fandek for accepting my invitation to come here. Metro Lydia? Dr. Bill, do you still want to see my video? Well, it's once <laughs> in a while, <laughs> but it's okay. If you don't want to see it on your video, it's fine. <laughs> Okay, no, thank you, thank you so much. But you can thank sit you. on that people should see you. Ah, uh, doctor, they have seen me. Okay. They did yeah. see me. They did see me. Can you see Metro Lydia, the group nursing service manager? Yes. <laughs> 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 she, 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 she's not sterile with this one. <laughs> I know I can see with even with her comments on the chat there. She's not a yeah. sterile one, but yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you, you, you know what, the Dr. Spussy, so you know what, I'm not sterile. You know, COVID, we have learned a lot of things most of the time. Even the GNSM was on the floor. Even the NSM was on the floor. So this is the team also that you need, you know? That you know what, when things are bad, you know what, you put in the, you, you remove the NSM head, you take the nursing head. Thank you, thank you, ma. Okay, do okay. the vote of thanks, Matron. <laughs> okay, Dr. Bila, okay. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Sbusi, so thank you, Prof. Van Dijk. Thank you for sharing your expertise with us. It was really worthwhile. We feel honored. Indeed, we need a transformation and we have embraced the digital that, you know what, this is the way to go. Thank you for reawakening us to the realities of life, which is digital also. We really appreciate the time you spend with us today. We hope it was well spent for you too. Thank you to all attendees and have a good night. Thank you, thank you. Thanks very much. Thank yeah, my, 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 my Some, internet connection is unstable. But thank you very much. Has Thanks for this. Hand. <laughs> is it? I yes, I don't know who raised the hand. Somebody has just raised the hand. I don't see that hand here from my side. Yeah, but I just want to say thanks, Kamu, for, 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 for marketing also for being with us. And the, the whole team, that, I mean, they, all the participants, they, we really appreciate you spending time with us every week. And we will connect again once again next week when we continue with our weekly webinars. And we wish you all a good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bila. Thank you. No, Siabonga Kakul, thank you very much for having us uh, at clinics, uh, Dr. Bila. And, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Spozuma. Yeah. Sure, sure. It was a pleasure having you, Dr. Right, Bila. Sure, thank thanks. you. No, thank you for having us. It was brilliant. It was really a good experience. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Thank you. Okay, bye. Thank you Doctor. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Enjoy Brookfontein. Thank you and enjoy Nurses Day, all the nurses out there.
Yeah, indeed. Thank Happy Nessus Day. Thank you. Yeah, but then Dr. Sbusso said we mustn't celebrate. <laughs> No, you can celebrate. There's so much to celebrate, but uh, I think we can balance between celebration oh, okay. and, uh, and okay. being catalytic. We are born. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we'll and balance. That, we'll balance, doctor. I, Thank you so much. I've also learned, uh, also uh, as part of the, the 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 engagement. Also, I think it actually also helps as we move along. It does shape and guide our engagement in other structures. So, thank you very much. Thank you, doctor. Definitely. Thank you so much. Right. Yes, definitely. Thank you.